today, we will be having a lecture on e-prescribing by Jody Wedret from UC Irvine. On Friday, we'll have the Sound of Film and Music by Robert Elias, president of the Orrell Foundation. Okay, for those of you who know me and worked with me before, thanks for coming again. And those of you who haven't, I enjoy working here and hope to work with you in the future. I became more and more interested in the topic of travel medicine over the last several months to year because I get a lot of people who come up to me and ask me these questions about what vaccines to get when they're traveling to different places. And frequently it's physicians, healthcare providers, nurses, and what have you. And it's a topic that's going to become more and more important as the years progress because more and more people are traveling. Does anybody know where this is? Machu Picchu. I went there actually in 2006, and it's evidence of the fact that people are doing more adventurous travel. One of the things that's interesting is that although more people are traveling, what's more important is that people are traveling to more exotic locations. People are traveling to places where they normally wouldn't have maybe 30 to 50 years ago, and definitely more than a century ago. You can reach everywhere in the globe within 24 hours with a miracle of plane flight. In this particular instance, I went to Machu Picchu, I hiked, I ascended all the way up to 14,000 feet, and I had several different travel-related associated complications from my health, and I can tell you more about it. But this just gives evidence to the fact that these are issues that you can address with your own patient, patients you can have sent to a travel clinic, but there is definitely an importance to doing travel, pre-travel consultations, whether you do it yourself, if you feel comfortable, I'll show you how to, or if you want to refer them on, there's several different places to do it, myself included. So briefly, what I'll talk about today is traveler's health epidemiology, the assessment itself, looking at their itinerary, sources of information you can use if you're going to be doing this type of practice or if you're just interested generally. Common diseases, I can't cover each and every disease because that would be the entire yellow book. And so I'll try to cover some of the most common things that you'll see as far as what's prescribed or what's recommended for vaccination or other issues if somebody comes to see you for a pre-travel visit. Travel vaccines, everybody seems to know about, but I'll just emphasize one thing here is that travel medicine and the pre-travel consult is much, much more than just travel vaccinations. And it actually can help the traveler in many ways if you can give them a pre-travel in-depth consultation. Okay, so re-emphasizing what I pointed out there briefly, these are older studies because this is not as easily found on the internet, but in general, if you look at the more recent studies, there's around 61 million Americans traveling internationally in 2009, according to the WTO. This study from 2005 is the most recent in the CDC presentation guidelines, and they say around 61 million. And I suspect that the numbers will continue to go up. Again, more and more people are traveling internationally because of the ease. Perhaps it's somewhat decreased now with an economic downturn, but I suspect once that's alleviated, it'll continue to be a very prevalent phenomenon. So 880 million people travel worldwide, internationally, just as of 2005. And the most recent number from uh, 2009, according to the WTO, is, is 880 million. It's, uh, this one's a little bit lower because it's 2005. So 880 million international tourist arrivals a year. Where do US travelers go? Well, Canada. No real inherent health risks there, obviously. Europe, the same category. People are going to Mexico, which I'll touch on more. Africa, less common, but I see quite a few people who are coming to my office because they're going on safaris. So if there's something in the community as far as people being interested in traveling, there's quite a few people interested in traveling to Africa on safaris. Caribbean is still popular, Middle East less so. so before I talk about some of the inherent risks of traveling, I'll just point out one specific category of travelers that turns out to be the most problematic, and that's what we call visiting friends and relatives. And these are people who were born in the developing world and who believe they're immune to the common diseases associated with it. They think they're immune to typhoid, hepatitis A, malaria, and frequently what we find is these are the people who actually get sick. In fact, 34% of U.S. travelers were VFRs in 2008. I suspect the number is higher now. 12% of the U.S. population are first or second generation immigrants. That's a significant number of people. 
68% of the imported malaria cases are from U.S. civilians who are VFRs, visiting friends and relatives. And 66% of the typhoid cases are from South Asia and Latin America. So th these are the actual people who are most at risk. These are the people who are going to be least likely to try to obtain a travel medicine consultation. In fact, I remember clearly during my training at all of you that I would see people in the clinic and I'd know that the next week that they were going to be traveling to El Salvador, to other places in South and Central America. And I'm pretty sure that most of these people did not get a pre-travel consultation and they fell into this category. In fact, when I trained at all of you, I had a woman who was of Thai descent who went back to Thailand and came back with typhoid fever. So what is risk? Well, it's difficult to calculate risk exactly when you talk about traveling because we don't have the exact numbers of how many arrive to a specific location and there we don't even have the numbers of how many people arrive to that location and get sick with a particular illness at that specific location. So the risk is difficult to judge. Most of the studies are from the 70s and 80s. But we do have some data and in general you can make some assessment that of 100,000 people traveling to a developing country for one month, 50,000 people will develop some type of health problem. These are based on the CDC statistics, an older study from 1987. 50, um, correction, 8,000 will see a physician, 5,000 will be confined to bed, 1,000, 1,100 rather will be incapacitated, 300 will be admitted, 50 will be air evacuated, and one will die. Now I'll touch more on how you can deal with these issues, but there are inherent risks in traveling. Now, what is the meaning of a risk? It's dependent somewhat on a subjective standpoint, meaning that when they looked at how many people get sick when they trek in Nepal, the number is around 15 out of 100,000. Now, one reviewer who looked at that article said, well, this just goes to show that the risk is low. Whereas the other reviewer actually said, well, the risk, this goes to show that the risk is high of getting hurt. So the point is, some of the idea of what risk is is subjective, and it's difficult to quantitate these studies, but there are some data out there. There's a newer study that the International Travel Society of Medicine is putting out in conglomeration with the CDC, where they have 17,500 people coming back ill from travel, and they're being monitored via something called the GeoSentinel network. And we should have some more data over the next few years using that. We do have some preliminary data there I can show you. By the way, uh, air evacuation is not covered by your health insurance. This is something I don't want to forget to point out. And this is something that I think many people should consider if you're going to be going to exotic locations. Fifty to $100,000 to be air evacuated. I recently had a local cardiologist come up to me at one of the hospitals and tell me that he was going to be going to East Africa in gorilla trekking. And he wanted to know if, if I thought he should get any vaccinations or pre-travel assessment. I said, yeah, I think that's probably a good idea. And then he actually went so far as to get travel insurance and evacuation insurance, which I'll touch on more lately, later. Okay, so just to give you an idea of uh, the estimated incidence, the rate per month of infections and fatal accidents among travelers to developing countries, uh, most common illness that you will get if you travel to a developing country is traveler's diarrhea, about 20 to 40 percent. Around 20 to 60 percent of people who actually travel will come down with some form of illness. Uh, traveler's diarrhea is 20 to 40 percent of those people. Malaria is less, less common. However, again, when you think about these things as far as risk, you'll say, well, look, it's very uncommon that I would get one of these. I mean, it's a little over 1 percent if I'm there for a month. But the problem is when you deal with diseases like malaria, the effect is catastrophic. Same thing with Japanese encephalitis. So that's when you have to make the analysis and discuss it with the patient. Is the risk, the risk of that particular disease justify the vaccination, even though there's a low risk comparatively? And I'd say, you know, for meningococcal meningitis, for people who are going to be exposed to potential yellow fever, people who are going to be exposed to Japanese encephalitis, polio, all those things may be low risk to where you're going, but the result of getting it is catastrophic. Influenza, fairly common. Dengue, which I'll touch on again later, is a very common illness to come back with, but it's only really 1% of people who are going to be there for a month in a developing country. Animal bite with rabies, again, low risk. But if you get rabies in the middle of a third world country in Central Africa, you're not going to be in good shape. 
actually, inter interestingly enough, read a recent CID article of a woman who, a young girl actually, who got rabies here in a rural county in California, and believe it or not, she actually survived, which I thought was fascinating. I think that was in the CID article last month, clinical infectious disease. Hepatitis A, again, low risk, but the chance of getting it won't be catastrophic, but it will ruin your trip. Same thing with typhoid. You could actually have a catastrophic event with, with typhoid. You could actually have an intestinal hemorrhage. Tick-borne encephalitis, hepatitis B, these are all lower on the list. Cholera and Legionella, all lower on the list. But again, lower on the list, the risk is low comparatively. However, the effect of getting it is catastrophic. This is a slide that didn't come out as well, but this is what I mentioned from the GeoSentinel network. These are the people who are coming back from certain locations getting certain diseases, okay? So the most common thing you'll see of all regions is chronic diarrhea. And I'll touch on this more later. Personally, I think that's a real downer. And my mom actually did travel to Indonesia and she got chronic diarrhea. Acute diarrhea is a little less common. People commonly come back with fever. This is a proportionate morbidity among ill travelers or returning from the developing world per, uh, didn't come out here, it's per 1,000. Bacterial diarrhea, I mentioned falciparum malaria, fairly low number, but again, this is a medical emergency, which I'll touch on. Insect bites and fatigue, and a number of others. Now, if you're gonna be going to the Caribbean, it's still fairly similar, but you see things slightly different, like larva migrants and parasitic diarrhea. Uh, if you're gonna be going to Central America, they're gonna be a little bit more issues with insect bite, larva migrants, and uh, some unusual travel-associated illnesses. And then finally, South America is fairly similar. And then Sub-Saharan Africa, what you really have to be worried about is malaria. I'll tell you one thing that you can take away from this lecture, if you, if you don't pay attention further, is that anybody who comes back with a febrile illness from Sub-Saharan Africa or a malaria endemic area, the main thing you don't want to miss is malaria. It's highly likely that they also have something called dengue fever, or they may have dengue fever instead. If you miss that, it's not as catastrophic. But if you miss malaria, the effects could be death. South Central Asia, more and more people are traveling to South Central Asia. In fact, of the number of people who are falling under the category of visiting friends and relatives, most of them are from Southeast Asia and other parts of Asia. Anybody know where this is? It's the same place. I just like this picture because I feel like I'm an explorer. I hiked up all the way to uh, the top of the mountains. And I hiked up all the way actually to um, the hidden city of uh, Machu Picchu. Does anybody know who discovered Machu Picchu? Bingham. Yes, Hiram Bingham. He wrote a book about it. I read that and I felt like uh, very inspired when I was up there. I'll tell you, funny, when I was on that trip, and I'll touch on this more, uh, we had several travel-associated illnesses among us. There was three of us, and we're all fairly young and healthy. I was 31 at the time. Um, my friend did not actually follow my advice and take Diamox. I took Diamox. Uh, my friend got horrible altitude sickness, and this is a fairly young guy. And I actually saw people hiking up the trail who got sick. Uh, and got so sick that they actually could not continue to ascend and got turned around. So that actually could spoil your trip if you don't pay attention. You shouldn't really elevate beyond a certain amount every day. In fact, on our travel, the itinerary was way too fast, if you ask me. It was 8,000 one day, 8,000 feet, and we ascended to 14,000 feet the next day. And it was weird because the first day of the hike was so simple, and my friend and I were saying, well, this is obviously just for tourists. This is not going to be rigorous. And we sat down to lunch on the second day, which is also fairly easy in the morning. And I thought this was really unfair. Uh, this travel company, you know, handed out beers to us. And then right after that, we, we literally went straight up for like two hours. And I have no idea why they thought it would be a good idea to give us beers. I actually didn't have one. My friend did. <laughs> and I'll tell you that about 30 minutes into that ascent, he was no longer saying this was just for tourists. He was actually wearing an oxygen mask an hour later. Okay, so age-specific issues. These are the things you have to think about when you're gonna be doing a pre-travel assessment. Do they have an underlying illness or suppression? Do a systems review, medical history, medication use, vaccination history, allergies, any contraindications to vaccinations? You'd be amazed what you'll find out 
people have in mind as far as what they're traveling. I've had somebody come in recently who told me that he's going to be traveling to Southeast Asia. So I took a few minutes. I was interested in this trip. The main things we talked about were vaccination for hepatitis A and B, typhoid. And then he went on to tell me that his intent was to go and have sex with prostitutes there. And this is a true phenomenon. There's a lot of people who have these ideas in mind. In fact, in Germany, they've had such problems with this that they have actually refused to pay for these people's health care when they come back. So I proceeded to discuss with him all the inherent risks of that type of behavior. And he actually had the impression that there was no risk or very low risk of getting HIV. In fact, for a male to get HIV with usual heterosexual sex could be fairly low. However, it's not no risk. Okay, and if he's going to be having sex with people who probably have STDs, the risk goes up higher. So you'll find out some amazing things as far as what people have in mind when they're going to be traveling. And I'm not saying I'm against travel. I actually love it. That's why I'm showing all these pictures. I just find it fascinating, you know, the, willi the risk we're well all willing to take when we're traveling. You have to keep in mind that you still can get hurt. Okay. Obviously, if a woman's pregnant or breastfeeding, this is a major issue. You don't want to be advising somebody who's going to be conceiving in a malarious area. Uh, you want to be, I'm sorry, you want to be able to uh, advise them as to the risk. It's not recommended. It's not recommended that a woman travel to a malarious area if they don't have to. Um, and risk-taking behaviors, which I touched on. You know, I'll tell you another thing. Okay, this is more or less the same. You know, get to know what their dates, their duration, stopovers. Gives you an idea of when to start the malaria chemoprophylaxis, when to stop it. Depends on the medication, which I'll touch on later. Seasonal considerations, the dry versus the rainy season. There's different risks associated with each. What type of travel are they going to be engaged in? If somebody's going to be going from an uh, air-conditioned bus to a five-star hotel, the risk of doing, uh, getting some type of infectious disease is fairly low. Uh, accommodation, hotel versus camping, as I mentioned, business versus tourism, adventure, safari. These are the people you become more and more concerned about. Missionary, humanitarian, NGO work. I'll show you a picture later of a guy who's been in Central Africa for years, and he doesn't want to take malaria prophylaxis every day for years. So what he does is he waits till he gets malaria, and then he self-treats, which is a fairly concerning prospect. But this is another fascinating topic that I read about when I reviewed some of these topics is medical tourism. And you may or, not, may or may not have had experience with this. There are an increasing number of people who are going to third world countries to have procedures done. I myself have had a patient come into this hospital who got a tummy tuck done in Mexico. Okay? And she came into the hospital here and she had an infected surgical site. And of course she had no insurance and we're all left hanging it, you know, holding the bag. And, you know, one of the things that I thought was fascinating when I read about this is that a lot of people don't realize in these developing nations that they reuse needles. I read there's something in the order of 65 to 75 percent, even though they're one-time use needles, there's a reuse rate of somewhere around 75 percent in some of these places. Now, it depends on which clinic you're going to, but those are high-risk issues that I think most people need to be considerate of. How about this one? You guys know where this is? It's local. Yes, Joshua Tree. I love hiking out there. Joshua Tree National Park. Okay, so if you're interested in these topics like I am, the more information you can find is actually on cdc.gov travel. Uh, there's a yellow book. Uh, State Department also will give you travel uh, updates. The International Society of Travel Medicine is actually a group that actually has a specific interest in this topic, usually infectious disease doctors. And then the yellow book is what I focused a lot on for this presentation. It's a fascinating website at the end of this new yellow book. It's called healthmap.org, which I really encourage you to use. It's wonderful. You just click on this. It will show you every outbreak or every particular epidemic happening in real time, and you can actually self-report something that's happening in your community. Okay, just to give you an idea of how to use the CDC website, it's very user-friendly, destinations, vaccinations, diseases, illness and injury, click on any of these, or you could just enter the destination. You can see pre-travel uh, notices, I'm sorry, travel notices, and an outbreak update. There's recently been an outbreak of leptospirosis in Peru. So you may want to consider advising those people to use doxycycline prophylaxis, and it may actually be useful for people who are already going to be exposed to malaria. You can use it for both instances. Again, click on any destination on the destination page. Outbreak updates, as I mentioned, will be reported there. Okay, so 
of all the things I just said, and you're probably thinking, wow, what about all these infectious diseases? The ironic fact is your highest risk, 10 times greater than any other, is a car accident. And people always look at me funny when I tell them this when they come in. I always tell them, you know, your highest risk of getting injured is actually via a car accident. You're 10 times more likely to get hurt, injured by a car accident than anything else. Around 280 Americans died in Mexico between 2007 and 2009 just from car accidents. So what I advise people is wear your seatbelt. Even if you're on vacation, you may be a little bit more relaxed. People drive poorly in general in third world countries. Depends on each and every person, obviously. The road conditions are usually worse. And the cars may not be as well maintained. These are people who just don't have the means. So road traffic, there's around 800, I guess, Americans who died total. 280 in Mexico alone, homicide. That's another fascinating thing is people don't realize the risk they may be taking if they're going to a Central American country. I heard a fascinating piece on the BBC that suggested that in Honduras, the murder rate is 82 per 100,000. It's like five to seven times that of Britain. And the point is, they don't even have enough money to bury these people. Now, the violence there may be more associated with drug-related issues, but if you're not cognizant of it and you're not paying attention to where you're going, you may be caught up in it. And I think in general, Americans have a tendency to be a little bit more naive in general, and they may be more of a target because people know we generally are a little bit well off financially. And I'll tell you, I've had my own experiences where I've been scared and concerned, so it's always good to remind people of this. And so what you can see is that the pre-travel consultation is much more than just, hey, how you doing, here's your vaccinations, we'll see you later. You can actually subtly affect people's behavior and hopefully help people. Drowning, unfortunately, is fairly common because people get relaxed. They go have a couple drinks, you sit by the beach, you get in the water, you may not be able to protect yourself and you drown. Suicide is probably more common than people who are there for a longer period of time with culture shock or there's some people who plan on going to a particular location to commit suicide. Ironically, terrorism is probably your lowest risk and all other those would be infectious diseases. Just to give you an idea of some of the numbers, in Mexico, 22,000 fatal accidents were reported. I think this was actually in 2008 and the rate is 20.7. In the U.S., it's around 14.9, something around that order of Greece, maybe a little bit lower. We have 42,000 fatal accidents in the United States a year. And you think India is just terrible, 105,000 know, fatal accidents, but you forget how many people live there. So the rate is actually slightly lower. So Mexico is really a high risk as far as travel and travel-associated accidents, motor vehicle accidents. So what are the infectious disease risks to a travel? Traveler, malaria, diarrhea, leishmaniasis, rabies, dengue, meningococcal meningitis, schistomiasis, leptospirosis. I talked about a recent outbreak. If you look on the websites when you see somebody, you'll get an idea of how you could potentially help them prevent it. Measles, right? So measles, we think, well, measles is not a major issue. Everybody gets vaccinated. You probably are well aware of the fact that we recently had three cases of measles here in the emergency room. And what's happening here is this is a somewhat separate topic is that less and less people are getting vaccinated. More and more people are traveling to exotic locations because of the ease. Herd immunity is down, and there's a potential for more exposure because people are bringing these diseases in. So this is one of the excellent ways that you can actually advise your patients on getting up to date on their previous vaccinations. People come in, and they may or may not need a few things, but you can also take a look and say, hey, you, you forgot you haven't got a Tdap. You should probably get one. We've had outbreaks of pertussis. It's a good way to check on their general health and get them up to date on all their vaccines. And unfortunately, there's been a movement in some, some groups and circles to really d downplay the importance of vaccines. And, you know, you'd say, oh, well, polio, that's been eradicated, right? Well, unfortunately, they've had major problems in Nigeria, and they've continued to have wild polio virus spread. And because of that, we still have wild polio in the world. Well, it really shouldn't be. Okay, I talked about some of these issues. Other things you want to think about. If people have psychiatric problems, make sure they obviously continue to take their medications. There's no reason that you should stop taking your medications if you travel abroad, especially in a third world country. Crime and assault. I'll tell you one story from my personal experience was that I went to the Czech Republic, this is about 15 years ago, with a couple friends and we took a taxi to a fairly uh, poor part of town because they had a cheap hostel. And I remember I handed the taxi driver you know, a, a large bill. It was like 40 or $50, I wasn't thinking, and I wanted to get change. And it became very clear within a few minutes, this guy was bald and it looked like he meant business, that he was not intent on giving me any change. And I argued with him for about 30 seconds, and it was the strangest sensation, I still remember it. I got this sixth 
sense that said, you know what? You should probably just get out of here. <laughs> and I did, and nobody got hurt. But this is one of the things you can remind people. If you get in trouble, just give them the money. And that's what we did. You really don't want to be taking chances in these places. Uh, altitude sickness, I touched on. Okay, so let's take a little break, and I'll tell you about a real case that came in here that's related to this topic. 38-year-old male uh, with no significant past medical history returns from Mexico. Fever, 101.3. Fatigue, muscle aches. He was camping outside in rural Mexico in the Baja Peninsula, and he was on a vision quest, which actually sounded like a lot of fun. Not sure what else he was up to. What is it? Uh, you told me basically they're taking uh, psychedelic drugs and they're doing all sorts of stuff. Uh, he was mildly anemic, he was neutropenic, he was basically mildly pancytopenic, and then all of a sudden he gets IV fluids and he feels much, much better. What do you guys think? What's the main thing that, you probably come in contact with this in your practice at some point. Yeah, it could be just dehydration. He has dengue, dengue fever. That's probably the most common thing that you'll come across, travel associated illness. If somebody comes into your office with a febrile illness, perhaps some of these symptoms, think about dengue fever. Obviously, the other point is, don't miss malaria. Okay, dengue fever, where is it common? Well, you can see it's all throughout Mexico and the Baja Peninsula where he was, all throughout South and Central America. It's spread by the uh, 80s gypsy mosquito. Uh, people have associated fever, rash, muscle, and joint pains. It's like a really severe influenza-like syndrome. Also throughout all of Asia. Now, what you'll find is that it usually goes into the same areas and spread sometimes by the same mosquito as malaria. And also uh, Southeast Asia, India, parts of Pakistan, and even Australia. It's a common, common thing for people to come back with. So it's an RNA virus. Bite of the affected mosquito is what spreads it. World Health Organization estimates that 50 million fevers, or sorry, 50 million cases of dengue fever occur each year. Uh, the infection rates, if you just look at serological people who come back with febrile illness from a tropical area endemic, it's around 3 to 8%. So that means of the people who come back with a febrile illness from an endemic area who come into your office, there's probably between 3 to 8% of those people are going to have dengue. Um, travel to the tropics, the subtropics, the incubation is usually 4 to 7 days. I think by the time he came and saw me, he had uh, been back for around 3 days. So he probably got sick toward the ends of his trip. Could be as high as 14 days. Two or more of the following is really all you need to make the diagnosis. Headache, retroorbital pain, muscle aches, joint pain, rash. Hemorrhagic manifestations become more concerning as they become thrombocytopenic and leukopenic. What you really have to worry about is if they're going to go into something called dengue shock syndrome, which is basically when the patient will become volume depleted to the point where they become hypotensive, narrow pulse pressures, or even go into frank shock. In fact, in this case, I felt fairly uncomfortable, even though he was already somewhat better with IV fluids. He was fairly neutropenic, and I wanted to watch him for one night, which we did, and he looked better the next day. However, it's hard to predict. The patient may potentially get worse, and you may actually be dealing with one of these complications. That's why you want to be extra careful. Um, how do you diagnose it? There's a serological test. You can actually check for an antigen, which is a little bit harder to get done. I actually checked this on him, but I think it was too early in the illness, and it came back and he never followed up for a repeat one. Uh, supportive care is all we really have. And the only way to prevent it is actually uh, preventing mosquito bites. This is what you really worry about, as I mentioned, abrupt change from fever to hypothermia. This is dengue shock syndrome, also known as dengue hemorrhagic fever, severe abdominal pain, persistent vomiting, bleeding, difficulties, then they become altered. And you know the morbidity goes way up once you get into this realm of the disease. Watch out for mosquitoes during the early morning and the late afternoon. That's when you're at highest risk. During the midday, you're less so, but that's when you're most at risk for sunstroke. Insecticides, I'll touch on more later as a preventative measure. Okay, so what are the things you should consider now for people who are going to be coming to your office or potentially who are going to be traveling? Well, you want to make sure they're up to date on all their vaccinations, like we talked about, Tdap good chance to make sure they've been MMR'd, and then good chance to assess whether or not they've ever had varicella if they're young. You may want to consider vaccinating them. Some people have actually had varicella. And then obviously the caveat would be Zostavax for people aged greater than 60. Some data, but it's not conclusive yet for people aged greater than 50. Pneumococcus and influenza, a good chance to get caught up on those as well. 
Travel related is almost always for every place they go in the developing world, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and typhoid. Now, rabies is only going to be a major concern if they're going to be out in rural areas that have known rabies and they're going to be there for prolonged periods of time. People are going to be doing humanitarian work. I had a girl come to the office who was going to Uganda and she was going to be working in a clinic. It sounded like it was going to be rural. She wasn't totally sure. We just decided to vaccinate her for rabies. That same physician who went to Eastern Congo, or I think uh, yeah, it was East Africa, uh, to go to gorilla trekking. We decided, because he's going to be outdoors, there may be some exposure to rabid dogs or other animals, we decided to vaccinate him for rabies. Uh, the same thing with uh, meningococcal disease. If people are going to be going on the hotch, there may be some people who are planning on going. And hundreds of people, unfortunately, get meningococcal meningitis every year. And it's simple to prevent. You just vaccinate them. Now, it's not 100% effective, but you're going to give them some immunity and prevent some uh, serious complications from meningococcal meningitis. Most people don't realize that if you get meningitis, there's a, high, there's a chance you're going to have serious long-term sequelae. Not everybody just gets better with ceftriaxone. And they may not be able to get the type of treatment that they really deserve or need at that time. Polio, as we mentioned, I vaccinated that young girl who was going to be going to do some humanitarian work in uh, Uganda because, you know, she's fairly close to some of these other Central African nations. It's hard to predict what's going to happen. You know, one of the things on the CDC website they'll point out to you is that although it may not be reported at one specific time when you're looking at it, there's always a chance there's something going on that we haven't been able to track as well. Some of these places just don't have the surveillance systems to be able to track each and every emerging disease. In fact, you know, if you're really interested in these topics, you can look at the Emerging Infectious Disease website. Uh, the other thing would be the World Health Map. Japanese encephalitis to Southeast Asia. Obviously, it's going to be people who are going to be outside for prolonged periods of time. And then yellow fever, we'll touch on some more later, is really one of the things you'll more commonly have people come in and need vaccinations for. There are some places you won't even be allowed to enter the country unless you show proof that you've had a yellow fever vaccination. And the reason is the disease can be so bad that they don't want any chance of somebody coming in viremic being bitten by a mosquito, spreading the, the cycle to their own mosquito populations and spreading it in, head, in hand to the, their own population. Okay, so let's just touch on some of the basic ones that you'll need to know about for somebody who's going to come in. I would mentioned hepatitis A. We probably all know it's person-to-person -person contact, uh, contaminated shellfish and other foods. It's shed in your feces. Very common vaccine-preventable disease. But I have people who frequently Although I'll tell them that the risk is fairly low, but you get it, it'll ruin your trip. I have a lot of people who just don't want to get it. And there's some weird sensation people have out there, unfortunately, probably related to some of the recent press, about getting vaccinations. I think it's a shame. Rural areas, trekking, poor sanitation. You know, if you're going to be out there and you get hepatitis A, it's going to spoil your trip. And you're really going to not enjoy it. Abrupt onset of fever, malaise, anorexia. There's no real treatment. And then something that's interesting to note is that people greater than 50, there's a 1.8% mortality rate. Where is it prevalent? It's going to be, uh, where is it endemic, rather? It's going to be uh, all throughout South America, Central America, all throughout highly sub-Saharan Africa, okay? as well as parts of the Middle East and Southeast Asia and the Cold War bloc of the former Soviet Union. And it's simple to prevent, just a series of two vaccinations. You do it once and then you do it again six months later, uh, even potentially 12 months later. And one thing that is even more useful to know is that let's say somebody's coming in, they're saying, hey, listen, I'm taking off. I don't have time to wait. What you can do is you can actually do a faster series. You can do a vaccination on day zero, repeat it on day seven, potentially again on day 21. This is if you're giving them the hepatitis B combined and get them some immunity before they go. Now, if you do that, the immunity is not going to be as long lasting. It's probably not going to be as good chance you're going to have a high level of immunity and you want to probably revaccinate them at 12 months. But Somebody comes in, like I had that guy coming in who was going to Southeast Asia with that weird itinerary. I just vaccinated for hepatitis A and then repeated at six months. Twin Ricks is the combined vaccination. Now, if somebody can't get the vaccine, this is unusual, you could consider giving them immune globulin and they'll be protected for about two months. Okay, hepatitis B is obviously contact with blood and body fluids, 90-day incubation. Most people don't realize that 30 to 90 percent of people who become infected with acute hepatitis B will go on to progress to chronic infection. And that's really a shame. I mean, this is a vaccine preventable disease. Now, why is it more common that you would get this potentially in a third world country? If you get into a car accident or you get hurt, you need medical attention. If you get blood transfusions, you have to worry about some of the ways these blood donor products are screened. 
Vaccine is easily uh, preventative. All vaccinated people uh, should, all people should be vaccinated who are traveling to high areas of prevalence, like I pointed out. But again, I have people who frequently refuse to get it. Another, th another groups you should be thinking about is IV drug abusers, men who have sex with men. There's a higher rate of uh, infection among those groups. Okay, it's slightly different. What's interesting is you'll see it among the Eskimos and the people of the northern parts of Canada and Alaska, Iceland, um, and also parts of South and Central America. There's some prevalence. Again, anybody going to Sub-Saharan Africa and then parts of uh, Asia in particular always worry about China. I have some women coming into my office who are chronic hepatitis B carriers. These are people who were born to mothers who carried hepatitis B and they were infected uh, vertically. Okay, what's another one? Typhoid fever. Here's a little interesting piece of history. If you're, does anybody know who Theodore Herzl was? Yeah, he was one of the major founders of the Zionist movement. He, uh, his sister, unfortunately, died of typhoid fever. So these are diseases that you probably, you know, just take for granted, or you may not know as much about in this day and age because we just don't see it and we can treat it for the most part. But in these third world countries, they still have a fairly significant amount of typhoid fever, and you can be exposed and get sick. So. Typhoid Mary is a classic instance, you know, in the United States it used to be prevalent. People used to get sick. In fact, in her case, she was an asymptomatic carrier and she was shedding it all the time and working in the food industry. It could be an acute life-threatening illness. Salmonella typhi is the cause, consumption of usually of water or con uh, food that's contaminated with feces. In general, these diseases are associated with people or places that just don't have a good containment of feces. There's a high amount of stool in the environment. They can't cleanse their water. Okay, 22 million cases of typhoid fever, around 200,000 related deaths per year. Mostly people who are going to be going to Southeast Asia, okay? As I mentioned, I had that woman who was a visiting friend and relative. She went back to Thailand, and she got sick with typhoid fever. Highest risk, as I mentioned, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Almost every disease falls in that category. Asia, and also South America as well. Okay, insidious fatigue. They get headaches, malaise, they get anorexic, they get a paddle split on megaly, they get a rose-colored rash, which is actually something that woman who presented to all of you had was interesting. And then the complications. Most people may not realize that there's a rate of intestinal hemorrhage and perforation associated with this illness. You can treat it, obviously, with uh, empiric fluoroquinolones. Now, the caveat there is that in some parts of Southeast Asia, it may not be as sensitive. You want to consider using a third generation cephalosporin, for instance, if they're in India or other countries nearby. And then it's very treatable, or I'm sorry, very preventable. I got typhoid shot when I went to uh, Argentina. I decided, why not? And you just have to get an IM shot every two years. Low rate of any type of side effect. Or if you don't want to take shots, you can take the oral live attenuated, but you have to take it every other day for four days, which is kind of a nuisance. Anybody know where this is? Iguazu Falls. Yeah, I went to Iguazu Falls, and I tell you, I got vaccinated for yellow fever, typhoid, and I took malaria prophylaxis because I figured if I get one of these illnesses, first of all, I'm an infectious disease doctor, and it'll look terrible. And then the second thing is, why take a risk? Yellow fever, also known as Yellow Jack, decimated Napoleon's troop, troops when he sent his brother to conquer Haiti, if you're interested in history. It's been around since, you know, probably the 14th century, the ancients of Mexico used to call it um, black vomit disease, and I can't remember the exact name they used for it. It's spread by a mosquito, the Aedes or the Haemagogus mosquito, and don't equate epidemiological silence, meaning that we don't have any reported cases recently in this area, I'm all good, I don't need to be vaccinated with no risk. Well, the chances are, as I mentioned, the surveillance systems frequently are not that it advanced in some of these areas. Argentina may be a different case. But the problem is, even though they're not reporting cases, some of the cases may be asymptomatic, meaning that some people in the area are actually getting viremic, getting bitten by mosquitoes, and there's an ongoing cycle, and it's just not being reported. It's very nonspecific illness. You start off with the flu, fevers, chills, and you get headaches and myalgias, and then if you progress, around 50% will go on to jaundice, hemorrhagic symptoms like shock, and then once you go into multi-organ failure, obviously your mortality goes between 20 to 50%. Where is it? <coughs> where is it a possible risk? All parts of South America, Brazil, Bolivia, Paraguay, where I was in the uh, northern parts of Argentina, Iguazu Falls. 
and all throughout West Africa and Central Africa. Some areas less of a risk, but I have people frequently who are going to be traveling into some parts of uh, Kenya, and so I always worry about the fact that they may somehow come in contact with the eastern border areas. Treatment is only supportive. We don't have a treatment for yellow fever. So if you get yellow fever, you know, the, the chances are you're going to be very, very sick. Uh, preventative is just basically vaccinations. And as I mentioned, several countries will require you to have proof of vaccination before being allowed to enter. And that's one reason you want to make sure that people are up to date on what's on the CDC website as, mo as far as which countries are like that. Because you don't want somebody to arrive to a place and obviously not be allowed to go. And you don't want to have to be vaccinated in one of these countries because they may be using a different formulation. In fact, this is the vaccine that we recommend here in the United States. That's a major problem as far as malaria prophylaxis, which I'll touch on later. Okay, now malaria. Most people are aware of the risk of malaria, and I don't have a problem giving people prophylaxis. Most people are willing to take it. They come in expecting to get a prescription. But most people are still astonished by how severe this disease can be, and there's a million deaths internationally every year due to this disease. 350 to 500 million infections worldwide. It's transmitted by the Anopheles mosquito. It's a major international health problem. And in particular, if you have an interest in HIV AIDS, people who have concomitant HIV with malaria have an increased risk of very high uh, HIV viremia and poor outcome. Fortunately, if you look at some of the sites in Sub-Saharan Africa and some of the interesting articles out there, you'll see that these people you know, end up dying for the most part. This is what it looks like with a microscope. This is the actual blood parasite. This is a good way for people to get an idea of how serious this is. Bursting through your red blood cell and then about to attack another one. This is that guy I mentioned who decided that he's not going to take, take the uh, prophylaxis every day. It may be somebody who will benefit, obviously, from the vaccine in the future, which is currently being worked on. He gets fevers and influenza-like symptoms. These are all from National Geographic website, by the way. They have wonderful pictures. Chills, headache, myalgias, and then he gets worse if he gets severe disease like seizures. Then you get confused. You can get kidney failure, and then obviously you get into complications of ARDS and what have you. How do you diagnose it? Well, it's pretty simple. You just do a blood smear. Clinical deterioration can occur rapidly. So if you ever have a case of suspected malaria, you really should be admitting these people to the hospital, even if they look fine. I had one guy come back from Nigeria when I was all of you, and he was one of these people who fell into the visiting friends and relative. He came back with a febrile illness and some anemia. We got very concerned. It turned out he didn't have malaria. As I mentioned before, the gold standard is the microscopy. This is Cambodia. This is a classic area where you can get malaria. Uh, these are some of the areas they've shaded in the entire country, but the, it's really in certain areas more, more so than others. Again, similar distribution of a lot of these diseases. Okay, if somebody believes that the patient has malaria, what I encourage you is really just call the CDC website. I mean, I think it's very reasonable in this instance. We just don't see enough of this disease here. They have a CDC malaria hotline. It's available almost, uh, I guess it's, it's during the, these hours, I'm sure if you left a message or you left an urgent message, they would call you back. The treatment is obviously going to be something called malrenone, which can be actually a prophylaxis, you may be aware of it, or something called Ardemir Lumam Fantrain, which I have trouble pronouncing. Uh, I'll tell you, one of the problems that you don't want your patients to get into is going to one of these places, not getting prophylaxis before they leave, and then taking something from there. There are some other drugs out there called halofaxane that have more serious side effects, including cardiac arrhythmias, and the CDC does not re recommend you take those. Okay, uh, how do you prevent it? Well, the bed nets, the problem is your leg might come out at night, you could get bitten. Chemoprophylaxis is malrenone. You take it two days before you leave, take it during, and then for a few days thereafter. It's very well tolerated. Unfortunately, we don't have any data in pregnancy. So again, we don't encourage pregnant women to tra travel to malarious areas. Doxycycline is probably effective as well, and these are all things that are effective, by the way, for falciparum malaria, which is the most virulent and the most uh, associated with serious side effects or serious uh, health complications. The problem I have with doxycycline is that it causes photosensitivity in some people. And if you're going to be out in the sun on a safari or hiking, you're going to be out in the sun. You don't want to be taking a photosensitive, photosensitizer. Okay, uh, the other drugs that you could consider, it used to be common, did anybody ever take mefloquine, also known as larium? 
You could take it just once a week. You know, 5% of people, usually for treatment doses, will actually get psychotic. And I don't think it's a good idea to be psychotic anywhere. It's definitely not a good idea to be psychotic in a third world country. Uh, I said that you have a potential of getting psychotic on mefloquine. Uh, and then I don't know. I'd have to look that up. Uh, anybody know where this is? Yes. Chichen Itza. I went there a few years ago. This is that game they play where they run around and they throw the ball into the hoop, but it sounds like it's more aggressive than our standard form of basketball. I brought this up because I think about Montezuma's revenge. Traveler's diarrhea is the most common associated travel illness. 30 to 70% 30 of people get it. And I got it when I was in Peru. We had to take a flight, and you know what? It was a very unhappy experience. I couldn't miss the flight because <laughs> I was in my residency. I remember I had to get back the next day, and I was not happy. Uh, they used to say boil it, peel it, and forget it. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work. In general, what you want to do is make sure the food is piping hot. Don't use any of the local water if you can avoid it. Bottled water is your best bet. If you have to, you can actually uh, use special substances to clean your water. That's a little bit harder to do. Uh, most common pathogen is going to be e tech and we actually did have a woman who got e tech here, probably from a local restaurant, and she developed hemolytic uremic syndrome, and so these things happen. High-risk areas, as I mentioned, they're all fairly similar, Asia, the Middle East, Africa, Mexico, and Central and South America, similar distribution to the other illnesses. The problem is, you know, once you get it, it's not going to protect you against a future attack because it's usually different things. And this is the main culprit. This is what I think happened to me. I, we got back from our hike, and we went to a restaurant, and we're all in a good mood, and I decided I'm going to get the buffet. I'm pretty sure that's what did it. <laughs> uh, stool contamination is the major issue. You know, they just don't have the, enough of a resource-rich infrastructure to be able to deal with their contamination issues, or poorly functioning refrigeration, which I think was the case here. Uh, sudden onset of mild cramps, urgent loose stool, severe abdominal pain and fever, vomiting, and then bloody diarrhea. Uh, make sure it's freshly cooked and piping hot. Avoid beverages that are diluted with non-potable water. Uh, things like fruit juices, ice, and milk. Salads you have to be careful of because they may have washed it. Bismuth is actually preventative. Most people don't realize you could take Pepto-Bismol as a preventative agent. You have to take it multiple times a day. It's four times a day. Some people have side effects. You shouldn't take it if you have renal insufficiency also. Um, Alcohol-based hand cleaners. I think almost everybody in this day and age is going to bring that with them. Okay, lactobacillus. There's no conclusive results. Prophylaxis used to be something they recommended. You just take an antibiotic through the whole trip. That's discouraged. We worry about antimicrobial resistance, and we also worry about the fact that you may be in an area that has some evidence of resistance. Uh, ciprofloxacin is still very effective in most instances, although I mentioned the caveat is in s some parts of Southeast Asia. You could do azithromycin, which would be one gram, or take it for several days. One gram is a little hard to tolerate, but you could take it times one and you're done. Uh, and usually I have to take these for maybe one to three days only. I usually give people a little bit extra so they'll have it. Uh, Anti-motility agents, most people do fine if they take lopiramide. There's some doctors who I mentioned this to who got concerned. They said if the patient's having bloody diarrhea, they wouldn't recommend they take you know, an anti-motility motility agent like lopiramide. But the CDC seems to suggest that most people, even if they have invasive traveler's diarrhea, will do f fairly well with it. And then oral rehydration therapy is really an uncommon thing. I mean, you'd have to be in a out in a rural area, not able to get water. This is more of an issue, I think, if you're traveling with young children. Uh, I touched a lot of these issues already, and just giving you an idea about altitude sickness, motion sickness I didn't touch on as much. You can use scopolamine as a way to prevent. Um, make sure that you have sufficient time for patient education, and then obviously you want to tailor your evaluation to that particular traveler. And make sure people understand you know, what's going on at that particular destination at that given time. Um, travel health insurance, I touched on briefly. You can actually buy this. There are several different companies that provide it. I can show you the websites afterwards. And you may consider evacuation insurance if you're going to be going to a very remote area. Hospitalization evacuation procedures, and then obviously obtaining travel, uh, medical care abroad, what they should know. I mean, one thing you could do is if you know you're going to be in an area and you have several chronic illnesses, you could find out ahead of time where you're going to get health care if you need it. Jet lag is unfortunately a very difficult stubborn problem that we don't have a curative agent for. Some people feel better if they take um, melatonin. 
And the idea would be you'd take it in the evening hours to help reset your sleep cycle, use caffeine as needed during the morning hours to help you stay awake. It's just difficult in general to get over jet lag, unfortunately. You want to try to basically readjust as fast, as fast as possible. Obviously, don't sleep during the day if you can avoid it. Uh, sun protection, a lot of people forget about how important this is. In fact, most people don't realize that you really want to put on the sun protection before you put on any topical insecticide like DEET. Because in fact, if you put the DEET on first, you may actually not get as much of the sunscreen absorbed and it may not be as effective. Obviously, other issues are what kind of uh, extreme heat and cold to be uh, exposed to, and then drowning issues. Ristoschistosomiasis, usually people are going to be going to Egypt or other places in the Middle East. It's fairly uncommon. You, know, you don't want people to be waiting in the Nile. In the, you know, that's, that's one way you could get it. Uh, leptospirosis, it comes out in outbreaks periodically, and we have one in Peru right now. Bottled water, and then also I touched on these issues already. Uh, how do you protect yourself from mosquitoes? Well, you use the mosquito repellent DEET. Um, and you can also buy clothes that are pre-treated with something called permethrin, which basically is going to give you additional protective measures. You also want to keep yourself covered head to toe throughout the day. Use of insecticide screens like we saw in that picture, air-conditioned rooms, use of aerosols, and uh, there's also something called purethoid uh, coils. Another thing I skipped over there for a second is it's a good practice every time that you go hiking at the end of the day to inspect yourself for ticks. Obviously, consider the prevalence of hepatitis B and C. People who are going to be exposed to STDs. As I mentioned, that gentleman is planning on having a sexual escapade in Southeast Asia. High risk issues associated with it. Tattooing and body piercing, auto accidents. And then obviously considerations of when you should be vaccinated for rabies. I think we touched on a lot of these issues, so I'll just skip ahead to this, the travel emergency kit. Most people don't think about this, but you could bring some of your actual medical records so you'll have it in the instance you get sick. And bring a few extra things like your glasses, some analgesics, and then the antibiotics and prophylactic medications prescribed, obviously. Band-aids and things of that nature. Post-travel checkup is not mandatory, but if somebody comes back from one of these places with a febrile illness, you probably do want to send them to somebody who knows a little bit about travel medicine or tropical medicine. And then you want to be especially concerned, as I mentioned, if somebody comes back with feverish chills and sweats, persistent diarrhea, and weight loss. I'll take a few questions. I have a couple of slides if you're interested. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I don't know if there's any real prophylactic measure you can use. You probably just want to use the DEET. That would be actually a preventative. And then uh, you want to stay in places that don't have it. You know, I'm serious. If you look at the CDC Yellow Book, their recommendations are inspect the bed and stay at nice places, obviously, you know coming. DEET is basically, it's going to prevent insect bites. It's, you can buy it on any, you know, off or any of these standard brands. You can buy it at the local drugstore. It may. I took it. I, you know, I took it when I was on that trip and I came back from Peru. It has antimicrobial properties. I think it does, and you know, my my suggestion is if they don't have any contraindication, that if they're going to be hiking on high altitudes, should really consider. It. You know, I forgot to mention this little tidbit: one in forty people who climb Mount Everest end up coming back dead. So you know, it's one of these things. If you're having people who are going to be doing really intensive things, people who are going to Peru, I know a lot of people took it. Uh, yeah, I can't remember exactly. I think you started around seven days before you travel. The only problem is obviously you're going to have increased urination. It causes you to be more acidemic. It's going to increase your respiratory rate, and you're going to be actually uh, alleviating the hypoxia via that mechanism. And I'll tell you something. It's interesting. The higher you get, the more sleep-induced hypoxia you're going to be suffering from. We slept that night at 14,000 feet, and I'll tell you, I had some of the most bizarre dreams, which is not uncommon, apparently. Yeah, I took the coca tea and everything. I, after a while, I didn't like it because I felt like it was too much of a stimulant. Yeah. Okay, I haven't heard about that. That's interesting. You you used it as Oh, as a way to kind of Okay, I mean there may be something there. I'd be interested to review if you have any literature. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, mefloquine's not as commonly used. 
uh, but it used to be the agent of choice. You have to take it once a week, but you have to take it for several weeks when you get back. Some people like to use it because they don't want to use um, doxycycline. Most everybody in this day and age would be getting something called malrenone, which recently went generic. Well, if you read the statistics in the CDC guidebook, it basically what they'll say is that 5% of people, mostly who are getting it at treatment doses, became psychotic. And there's a known association with people having weird side effects with it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>